uh, today I get the opportunity to kick off this new series that we're starting. It's called Dealing with Doubt. Uh, and the reality is this, is, <laughs> is if you drew breath this morning, you have a belief system. Now, we may not be- agree upon our belief system, but your belief system is shaped by how you answer your doubts, all right? And our, our belief systems are, are, could be in agreement with one another, or maybe they aren't in our life circumstances. Everything has a, has a role in shaping that. But really what we believe in comes down to how we answer certain questions. And I don't know, and I'm going to be vulnerable today with you, some of the questions that I've asked myself over the years. Um, so if they relate with you, then great. Uh, hopefully you can resonate with them. If not, then feel bad for me because I have these doubts. Um, but hopefully somewhere along the line you can relate with them. But I don't know if you've ever a- asked yourself questions like, does this really matter? Does my faith really matter? Or am I making a difference? Or can I make a difference? Or how about when we get in a really dark place with our doubts, do I really matter? Does anybody really care? Or what about, do I really care? Can I, can I get through that project? Is that project even going to work? What the heck were they thinking? <laughs> you ever have that one? It's like, why did they even do that? All these are forms of doubt. And if, if you ever ask yourself questions of like, I don't know what they're thinking, there's no way that's going to work. Those are all types of doubt. And I could go on and on, trust me, I've got a list of them. But um, the reality is this, we have doubts. And how we answer those doubts really shapes what we believe. Now, I don't have time to go into every type of doubt that we have. And I'm going to try and focus more upon how doubt challenges our faith. But I'm going to trust that the Holy Spirit's going to bridge the gap. Because the principles that we're going to talk about today really do transcend our faith. Um, but I can really only speak to like one thing so it stays on track and you guys can resonate with it. But I'm going to ask that God gives you the ability to connect the dots in your own personal experiences. And I trust that God's going to do that. So during this series, uh, we have a passage of scripture that um, I really want to kind of kick us off with here. And it comes out of James chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. And who will give it generously. And he's going to give it to everyone without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Now, I want you to, to think about with doubts. I want you to just start with this whole series knowing that there's a couple elements that we need to have when we start having our doubts. First one is wisdom, okay? And then after we get our wisdom and we ask God for wisdom, then this is what happens. Keep going. But when you ask, you must believe <laughs> and you not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. So you need wisdom to kind of sort through the details of things, and you need belief to overcome the doubt. So you've got to have wisdom and belief. And so as we go into this today, just know that that's what we're asking God to do, is give us wisdom and a a solid belief system. Because if it doesn't happen, what we'll experience in our lives is it will just blow around like a, a wind, a wave out in the wind. It just goes like this, and we might be thinking, oh, I really believe this, and then someone comes along with a better argument, and it's like, Oh, well, I really believe this. And then someone, oh, maybe I, don't. I believe. And then we get to the point where I don't even know what I believe anymore. Who really cares? Does it really matter? And that gets us to a really bad spot. And so we don't want to do that. And so that's why we want to be able to give you the tools to be able to understand how to deal with the doubts that we have within our lives. So I want to open up with a word of prayer just uh, before I get into the meat of the, of the message this morning. Let's pray. Dear God, I just uh, come before you right now, Lord. I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to share your word. And God, I just pray right now for a supernatural anointing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, whatever I say that is true, uh, just seal it up in our hearts. And whatever is false, just let it fall by the wayside, God. And I just, I really trust, Lord, that you're going to do a work that only you can do in our hearts and minds. Lord, I pray ultimately that everything that's said and done here today is glorifying to your name. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let me, let me challenge you when, you, when you begin to think about your doubts, I don't want you to think that you're a bad person if you have doubts. Because having doubts does not mean that you're a horrible, rotten Christian. Like if you were a really good Christian, you'd never doubt. That's a bunch of hooey. Okay? Because I want to I tell you, faith without doubt is a faith untested. All right? Faith without doubt is a faith untested. And, and you need to just keep that in your mind for a second to figure out what you really believe about that. But I, I don't want to like try and prove my point, but I'm going to kind of. Um, so I want to just explain that. The, the reality is this. When, when we talk about faith, we just have, it's, it's a belief system. And so I want to read to you, we all have these beliefs. And while we may not agree with our beliefs, your belief system is contingent upon the strength 
of your faith in your belief system. So your belief is contingent upon your faith. Now your faith is contingent upon how you answer and resist doubt. Okay? Doubts come from others. They try and poke holes in it. Doubts come from ourselves. Doubt comes from the enemy. Doubts come from our personalities. Doubt comes from all kinds of places. But how we resist it and the answers we find to resist it are really going to be uh, the answer to how strong our faith really is. So this is what I want you to think about when you think about your faith. We all have beliefs, and they're only as strong as our faith. And your beliefs will be tested by your doubts. The question we have to answer is, will our faith stand the test of the trial? Because the trial is coming. I don't, and, and if you haven't had it yet, it will. All right? You just have to be prepared for it. So all we're doing today is just trying to help you be prepared for the imminent trials that will ensue. Maybe you're in the midst of it right now. I don't know where you're at, but I know that God is right there with you, and, and he's going to do something within you during that time. So uh, when we go to understanding, like, how do, we, how do we really identify these doubts, and how do we really deal with them, uh, there's something that I want to also help us understand before we get too far into it, is that not all doubt is equal in its origin. They don't all come from the same place, all right? So when you think about what kind of doubt are you dealing with, it gives you a different answer for how you deal with it. And so we're going to be, um, it's going to make more sense as we continue to dive into this, but what we really have to understand is when we're dealing with the doubts in our minds, all right, and that's really where doubt exists, it's right in between these two ears here, um, when we deal with that, we have to address it appropriately. So you can't address one type of doubt with an answer that actually answers another type of doubt. And here's what I mean by that. Um, Gary Habermas uh, wrote a book called Dealing with Doubt. I had every intention of reading it before I preached uh, this sermon, but I didn't. All right? So all I got to do was open the cover and uh, look at the, it, like the index, and it tells you what the, how he breaks it down. And he, and he identifies three types of doubt, and that's as far as I got because my mind went off to the races as soon as I read it. So... Apologize to Gary Habermas. I stole your three levels of doubt, but that's all I got. All right. So if I repeat anything Gary Habermas said, praise God, Holy Spirit's working. If not, I apologize. I slaughtered whatever he was trying to write. So, uh, but he identifies three types of doubt as factual doubt, volitional doubt, and emotional doubt. And that's what we're going to break down is uh, what type of doubt are we dealing with. And what I mean by not, they don't all have the same origin. You can't answer emotional doubt with facts. You're going to get someone that's really mad at you. And you don't answer factual doubts with emotion because you're going to have someone that looks at you and thinks you're an idiot. And volitional doubt, you really don't want to answer with emotions, all right? And you'll understand why in a moment. But our, our, our willful doubts can get us into some serious trouble. So I'm going to break down each one of those types of doubt. And really today is all about you um, identifying what type of doubt are you really dealing with in your life. And sometimes we exist in all three areas at a time, but depending upon what we're doubting depends on what type of information we need to gather to satisfy that doubt, all right? So let's dive into this a little bit. The first one is factual doubts, and it's pretty simple to understand what I mean by factual doubts. It's, it's simply doubt in facts, all right, or doubt that can be resolved by facts. And so I don't know about your uh, faith heritage, uh, but I want to give you a little bit of an example of where I've come from. I I, I grew up in a Christian home, in a, in a very good, godly Christian home, and I grew up going to a Christian school, and oftentimes I get this, um, as soon as people hear that, they're like, oh, you're one of those, you don't even know what you believe because it just was ha handed down to you. And if, if that's what you believe about me, you have no idea what kind of a man I am, uh, because I have questioned everything since I was out of the womb, all right? In fact, it, it's to the point where I just want to know how everything works. Uh, the guys laugh at me on staff because if they leave anything in their offices, it's likely I'm going to pick it up and tear it apart or just study it or play with it or do something just to figure out how it works because I just want to know how it works. And if I do that with a pen or a fidget spinner or anything else in this life, you got to imagine I do it with my faith. And I've been doing this since I was young. So because I was raised in that environment, I've been asking why to some questions 
for a really long time. And so if you're a teenager here, these, I started this quest before I was even 14 years old. So these were some of the questions I started asking myself from a very early on stage of development in my faith. And, and my challenge is, I bet you probably have too at some point in time. So here's some of the questions I had to ask myself to figure out if I was even going to believe in this, in this God thing. Because Just because I was raised in a Christian home doesn't mean I had to believe it. So I wanted to know, okay, what does it really mean? And so these were some of the questions. Is, is the Bible really God's inerrant word? All right. Is the Bible really God's inerrant word? And, and if you don't know what that means, then you probably really haven't read the Bible and you really don't even know what the Bible says about itself. So I had to settle that question. If I'm going to believe what the Bible says, I want to know why. And I want to know what evidence there is that helps support the factual evidence that the Bible is what it says it is. Is God really who he says he is? And everybody thinks that that's really a, a faith statement. Well, I have record of the things that he said in the Bible I want to see if there's any evidence of that in the world, in the history of the world, that it has existed. Is there any truth in that? That's facts. Did the flood really happen? You might be thinking, well, the flood doesn't really matter. That's just an allegory from the Old Testament. Well, that's fine if you believe that the Old Testament's the only thing that talks about the flood, but we have a guy named Jesus who talked about the flood as well in the New Testament. New Testament's Greek, which is linear and factual. Old Testament is Hebrew, which is allegorical and story-driven. Okay, so Jesus is either lying about the story he's repeating or he's telling the truth. I had to settle those things. Questions like, was Jesus real? Was, did Jesus really rise from the dead like he said he did? Or were some of the other people that said he just, it was just a story or they hid his body or it was just mystical or it too was just a story of, for faith people that really don't have any backbone? I had to deal with all those things, and I, I had to find facts to, to help me understand what I was really going to believe about that. So during my quest for discovering the truth that I was on a mission to discover, uh, when I came across the scriptures in, in John, I loved the, the disciple Thomas. All right? Now, many of you might know Thomas by his name that we've given him, Doubting Thomas, but I don't give him that name because I don't like that name, because it, it suggests that it's negative. And I don't think Thomas had a problem, all right? Now, I think because his faith is what really inspired me to know that I'm not as bad off as what I think I am at times, all right? So I'm going to pick up the story a little bit of where Thomas was at and why he was an inspiration to me. Now, here's what I encourage you to do, okay? So I'm not going to dog on anybody, so don't raise your hand on this. But one of the common things I get from people is, do you read the Bible? No, I don't understand the Bible. That is just the lamest excuse ever. All right, I'm going to give you a little secret to understand the Bible. All right, you ready for this? It's going to blow your mind. Pretend you're one of the characters in the story and let the story come alive. It's that simple. Pick out one of the characters in the story and then read it like you were there. Ask yourself the questions. Imagine like you were a part of it. Let the scriptures come alive. And when you do that, you're going to take part in the scriptures like never before. It's going to make it come alive to you. So here's, here's where I did that. So I, I pictured myself as Thomas uh, in this story, all right? So it comes out of John chapter 20, and it says this. I'm not going to go to all of it. Jesus has already died, risen from the dead, and, uh, the, and, and now the Jewish leaders are all coming in, and they're arresting all the followers of Christ, and everybody knew who the followers of Christ were because they were disciples of Christ, and they had followed him around. And so they knew uh, they were in trouble. Because the Jewish leaders are coming to arrest everybody. All right? So that's where we pick up the story. So on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked, all right, so here, I gotta stop right here because we gotta get in the story, all right? So we're all huddled together. Our, our rabbi had just been slaughtered on the cross, all right? We'd seen him beat within an inch of his life. We're next. So we're huddled together, we're hiding, we lock the doors, and we're scared for our lives. And then. Jesus came and stood among you. And you're like, oh, God, who is this person? I oh, poop my pants. And Jesus is like, just, no, 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 peace be with you. I'm like, Jesus, what are you doing? I just, I got to go wipe. What are you talking about? Like, I mean, see, that's how I make the scriptures come alive. See, that's how you do it. And then you can actually imagine like you're there. Now, granted, I might be a little junior highish in that, but it helps. It helps to actually be real. Can you imagine you're locked in a room and, dude, someone shows up? That's a little freaky. I don't know about you, but my mind is like, dude, that's pretty awesome. So Jesus had to say, whoa, 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 whoa. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Don't worry. I mean, 
We would be freaking out if we knew we locked the doors and somebody just stands in the middle and it's the guy that we thought was dead. So you just got to put yourself in there. And then he goes like this. After that, he said, he showed them his hands. He said, guys, look, it's, it's really me. Trust me. Because your mind's got to be racing. Like, Who is it? He says, you see my hands? And then he said, look at, my, look at my side. So he's showing the disciples all this. He's proving to them factual evidence. I am who I am. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father, he, now, now they're settled down and he, they can actually listen. Peace be with you. He has sent me and now I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, for if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Keep going. Now Thomas, my buddy Thomas, not, not doubting Thomas, his name was Didymus. I don't know how he's, whatever. One of the twelve. He wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. So Thomas wasn't even in the room yet. So we're good friends we leave the building, now watch what happens. So the other disciples told him, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, guys, unless I see the nail print, like unless I get to see what you saw, unless I get to touch the scar that you got to touch in his side, there's no way I'm believing that. Okay? And unless I do that where his nails were and put my hand aside, I won't believe. So imagine this, all right? So we're in the story. We're letting the story come alive. Imagine the most obstinate, stubborn person you've ever met in your life, all right? Don't look at anybody. Just imagine that person, all right? Get that person in your mind. And now you get to try and convince that person that you saw Jesus and they weren't there. And they're like, yeah, you're crazy. You're out of your rock. You're off your mind. You're out of the, you've lost your rocker, man. You aren't even, I'm not believing you to save my life. You're, you guys were smoking pot when you were in there, right? So a week later, his disciples were in the house again. So this goes on for a week. So imagine you're with your buddies for a week. Imagine the angry arguments you got into trying to prove to that stubborn, obstinate friend that he needs to believe in Jesus. Now listen, watch this. So Jesus knows what's happening in Thomas's life. Oh, go away. Oh, right there, yeah. And Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked again, all right, so they're still fearing for their lives. They're crowding around. They're in the locked room. Jesus came and stood with them and said, now the other guys are like, watch what's going to happen to Thomas on this one, right? Imagine they're just like, and then he's like, oh, and then Jesus is like, no, 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 peace. Just chill out, guys. It's, it's me. And now watch what happens. Then he said to Thomas, he's there just for Thomas, all right? He starts out, hey, Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach, reach your hand and put it into my side. He's doing for Thomas what he already had done for the other disciples. This wasn't, Thomas wasn't asking for anything different than what God had done for the disciples. He just wanted to see it for himself. Stop doubting, he says. And then Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. That, he's like, I believe. That was all it took. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me and you have believed, blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. I believe to the core of my being that Thomas' story is in there for people like you and I that may have our own doubts. You see, because if they all would have been there in the beginning, there wouldn't have been, yeah, I just don't, we could make up the story. Their story could have been consistent. But Thomas resisted for over a week. I can't believe it. I don't believe, yeah, but we were all there. Yeah, I just don't believe it. So, it, and then Thomas sees it. And you might be like, well, I didn't see it, so I still don't believe it. Thomas was us. Thomas was the one that wasn't there. He's, his testimony is the one that we can resonate with because we weren't there. And then Thomas says, and then God says, blessed are us, those of us, that don't get to actually experience what Thomas did, but Thomas represented what we really want. And I don't know if you know the rest of the story of Thomas, but um, the really cool thing about Thomas is soon after this, he went on his own mission. And when Thomas... We have record, evidence, facts, all right, because we're dealing with facts on this one, uh, that Thomas's influence went all the way to Tamil Nabu, Tam I can't ever say it, I got to look it up, Tamil Nadu, India. Tamil Nadu, India, do you want to know how far Tamil, pff, that word, you want to know how far that city is in India from Jerusalem? I know you do, Go, I'll tell you. It's 4,600 miles on foot. That's traveling through Syria, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, all the way to the bottom part of India, the, little, the lower part that goes into the ocean. 
The, West, the Eastern church that spread from there was much to do with Thomas and his influence. And you'd think that Thomas got to go on and live a ripe old life, right? No, he was murdered. He was martyred for his life and faith in Christ. So just because, just because we have doubts doesn't mean that we're a horrible person. We just have to settle our doubts. Now, here's what I want to tell you with your factual doubts. You may not go on and proselytize a nation. You might, but you may not. But what I can guarantee you is once you settle your factual doubts, you're going to do far more with your faith than you ever will in your doubts. You've got to get your doubts settled. So you've got to study. You've got to read. You've got to research. You've got to answer the questions that you have. Don't pretend like they don't exist. They're keeping you from doing and believing in God. God has things for you, but you've got to answer those doubts. The second area that we're going to talk about is volitional doubt. All right? Volitional doubt is just willful doubt. This is where you choose to believe that your ways are better than God's ways. Now, we might think that, that well, that's just dumb. No, it's just real. All right? Now, I could pick a whole lot of characters out of the Bible that did this. All right? There's a lot of examples of it. Um, but I, I'm fascinated by Jonah. All right? And I'm fascinated by the story of Jonah. Because typically when we read about someone that has volitional doubt, except for Ananias and Sapphira, um, their story changes with repentance. Um, Jonah, his story ends kind of crummy. And uh, we, don't, we don't really get to see Jonah's attitude changing. You see, Jonah was volitionally defiant of God from the start of the call. Because his doubt manifested itself a little bit differently. We think, well, we just know better than God. Well, that's a form of doubt because what we're really saying is, I doubt what you're saying, God, is really going to be good for me. I don't like what you're saying because it's not really resonating with me. doesn't really fit my personality. Don't really like it. Not going to do it. All right, that's volitional doubt. Okay, so that I'm going to start with Jonah here. We aren't going to go through the whole story. All right, I'd encourage you to read the story if you don't know it. But he's already jumped out, or actually been thrown out of the boat. He's already ran from God from Tarshish. He's already gone to Nineveh, preached. They all repented, and now he's mad because they repented. And uh, and we have Jonah towards the end of the story, and it's coming to a close. And we're starting at Jonah chapter four, uh, verse one. And he said, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong because the people repented and they got restored and, and God was pleased with them and he relinquished his wrath upon the, nation, the city and Jonah's mad. And he became very angry. Uh, and if you've never been angry at God, again, your faith probably hasn't been tested yet um, or you're really obedient. I don't understand that part, but you, <laughs> I love obedient people. They're great. I'm just not one. All right, so he prayed to the Lord. Not... I, whatever. I try to be obedient. I'm, see, I'm defending myself, and, and God knows I'm a liar. All right, so he prayed to the Lord, and isn't this what the, I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is that argument that we get with God, and I don't know if you've ever tried to defy God. It does not work, but it's when we think our ways are better than his, and, and I make fun of myself, but I really do. I struggle sometimes with doing everything that God asked me to do, because it doesn't always mean pleasantries. And I don't always like that. And I think that there's better ways sometimes. And so you got to be honest with yourself. So this is that argument. And this is Jonah's like, he's mad at God. He said, this is what I knew was going to happen when I was still at home, God. He said, that's what I was trying to forestall. And I knew if I just waited and I fleed to Tarshish, I knew it wouldn't happen. I knew, I knew that you're a gracious God. I knew that you're a compassionate God. I knew that you were slow to anger. I knew that you were abounding in love. I knew that you were a God that relents from sending a calamity. I mean, if you're me and if we're here today, we're like, yeah, that's the God I serve. And Jonah's like, that's the God I hate because I wanted the Ninevites to die. Think about that. He hated the Ninevites. He wanted them to be wiped off like Sodom and Gomorrah. He knew God was going to, and he doubted the outcome. He didn't, he didn't think it was going to be good. He didn't want to be a part of it. I don't want to be a part of this, God. I don't think this is going to be what I'm going to like and enjoy. But he realized he better change his ways along the way, but he still wasn't happy. Now, Lord, he's so mad. He says, Lord, take my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. I want you to remember that phrase. It's better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied to him, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? Should you really be that angry that I'm such a gracious God? Look at Jonah's response. Oh, wait, go back one. Did I miss one? I thought he said yes. Okay, keep going. It's coming. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter 
and he sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen in the city. So, so now he's, he's like, all right, maybe, maybe God will. He, God said, is it really right for you to be that angry? He's like, okay, well, I'll go wait and see if what's going to happen. So I'm going to sit up here on this hill and watch the city. So that's what's happening there. And then he goes on. Again, you're putting yourself in the story. You're Jonah. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant. So Jonah made this little shelter. God brings a, a leafy plant, makes a little shade for him, made it grow over Jonah to give him shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. So even in the midst of Jonah's attitude towards God, God's still watching out for him. I love that. God is so patient with us in our, in our arrogance. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. Think about it. I mean, he's, he's sheltered from the heat. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm <laughs> which chewed the plant up. I love this. God's like messing with them. This is awesome. So that it, with, so that it withered. Well, now look what happens. Keep going. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching... So now, not only did he wither the plant, now he's going to bring a wind in. Thanks, God. You ever been there? It's like, nah. Those, That's what Jonah knew was going to happen, right? And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint, and he wanted to die. And he says to God again, it would be better for me to die than to live. Remember that phrase. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be so angry about the plant? And Jonah, this is where I thought I was earlier. Jonah says, it is. <laughs> Okay, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. Those are some pretty harsh words to talk to God with, right? But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this stupid plant. He didn't say stupid, I put that in there. That's me putting myself in. That's me trying to think like God. I don't know if he actually said stupid, but I would feel that way. He said, you've been worried about this plant, though you didn't even tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 souls? You're more worried about this plant than people. There's 120,000 people. And I love this part, okay? So he starts with the people, and then he realizes who he's talking to, Jonah. So instead of going with people, he says, well, shouldn't you at least be concerned about the animals? All right, you're worried about the plants and animals. They live in the same kingdom, so you should at least be concerned about their animals, right? So God, and that's, again, my sarcasm in this whole thing. I think God's like playing with Jonah's emotions a little bit. But you see the difference in what God answered Thomas, who had factual doubt, compared to Jonah, who had volitional doubt. God can make the willful, disobedient individual pretty miserable to get their attention. But God will t treat the one who's searching for evidence with entirely different practices. So that's why when we say not all, fat, all uh, doubts come from the same origin, you just have to figure out which one are you struggling with because your answers are going to be different. God's going to deal with you differently. we got to trust that he's going to deal with us in those areas. You see, I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're in the factual doubts or maybe you're in volitional doubts. But I'm here to tell you, when God has to deal with the volitionally... Uh, disobedient doubter he he can do things to get our attention and and many people think well i i have never really heard god clearly say that to me i've never really been told to go to a city and do this or that so i really don't think i would deny god quite like that mm, think about that you've been given the scriptures right and, and god's pretty clear about how he expects us to live in relationship to other people and oftentimes, we don't like what he says. For example, um, I've talked to lots of business people in, in this world before, and I challenge them that they need to practice uh, honesty in their, in their dealings with their businesses. And, and they'll look at me like, I can't run my business like that. If I did that, I wouldn't make any money. Okay. Or, or when you're talking to teenagers about relationships. Well, if I really follow God and what he says about relationships, I'm never going to have a relationship, so I really don't need to follow him, right? Or when you talk to someone about uh, their sexuality, I don't care, heterosexual, homosexual, I don't care what, when you're talking about, when you're talking about sexuality, um, they're like, well, if I followed God's archaic rules in the scriptures, uh, that clearly he didn't know what it was like to live in the year 2000, so if I did that, I, I really would never be happy, and, and I would never be fulfilled. You see, what happens when we start talking about volitional doubt, what we're saying is what God tells us in his word is not really accurate for today's world time. And, and if I really follow what God says, then he's really not looking out for my best interest. And, and God, I really, 
I really know what's better for me than you do. Hmm. So maybe, maybe he's not sending you to a city. He's just trying to have you start with the word. But we willfully deny him. And, I, and trust me, folks, I've lived, I've lived disobediently in the volitional doubts. I've lived in the factual doubts, and I've lived in this last area. So let's move on to emotional doubt. All right. So emotional doubt is, is really uh, the one that I believe that if, if we leave doubt unchecked, I believe that unchecked doubt, all of it will turn into emotional doubt. You have to deal with your doubts. You've got to properly identify where is your doubt coming from because if we don't, something's going to give. You're going to be, you're going to be left wondering in some area of your life, right? So I could use a lot of different passages here as well, but I'm going to jump into the story of Elijah. I don't know if you know Elijah's story, but Elijah was, was an amazing prophet of God. And uh, where we're going to pick up this story, he had just killed all the prophets of Baal. And, and when I say just killed, I mean it was actually his hand. He had actually taken the sword and killed them because no one else would, and he did. And uh, he had beat the prophets of Baal, and if you don't know the story, you've got to go back and read it. But he was on a mountaintop experience. You might think, well, that's just weird. Well, that was, that was Old Testament. You just got to understand what was going on. God had called him to do that. Um, and so now Jezebel was, was the queen of the land, and she was a worshiper of Baal. So she's tort. So King Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and now how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah and said, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. So I don't know about you, but again, if you put yourself in the story, all right, you're on a mountaintop of high experience, you just saw God do amazing things, like you are soaring, and then all of a sudden you get a death threat from the queen. Your day changes. One moment you're at a high, the next moment you're low, Elijah takes off in fear. Watch this. Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness. So he didn't even want anybody around him. He's like, get away from me. I'm done. I'm, I, I, I need to run for my life. So he goes. He came to a broom bush and he sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. Huh. Seems like I remember Jonah praying something similar to this. So I want you to understand the way that God dealt with volitional doubt versus emotional doubt is way different. Because watch what God does for Elijah. He doesn't send a bush that withers. He sends something different. Watch what happens. Jo Elijah says the same thing that Jonah said. I've had enough, Lord. He says, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Just, just take it. I'm done. Then he laid down under the, broom, under the bush and he fell asleep. And all at once the angel touched him and said, Jonah, or Jonah. Elijah, get up and eat. Get up and eat. And Elijah's like, dude, I'm in the... And he looks around and he goes, oh, there's some bread baked over hot coals. I love that detail. God and Jonah... Man, I keep saying that. Elijah's emotional state bakes him some bread and gives him some water. And he says this. He ate and he drank and he went back to sleep. And the angel... Go ahead. And he lay back down again. Keep going. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. He knew that it, God knew that it was going to be too much for Elijah to continue to go on. And so he gave, him, he, he gave him more food. So he got up and ate and he drank. And strengthened by that food, he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. So I want you to think about this for a second. You're, again, you're in the story, 40 days and 40 nights. Now, last year I went on this little journey. I tried to hitchhike from Sacramento to Washington, D.C. And uh, I got stuck in the desert out in Nevada. And, and I, I didn't have 40 days out there, but I had enough time to have a lot of doubts. All right, And I, I was stuck with myself in the desert in some scorching heat. And uh, I just want to sh share with you, the thoughts were not good. All right. There were a lot of, when you have that much time on your hands, the thoughts can get to you. All right. So I can't imagine Elijah doing that for 40 days on the run. The doubts. God, why did you do this? Why did you allow that to happen? What about this? What about that? I can't even imagine the doubts that he was running with during that time. Keep going. And there he went into the cave. Once he finally got there, he spent the night. He's wasted. He's, he's tired. Not wasted in a bad way, but like spent. And at the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord came to him and said, Elijah, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Elijah's response, I've been very zealous for you, Lord God Almighty. See the response? Elijah's response is different than Jonah's. Jonah was angry. Elijah's sad. Elijah's just done. He's spent. 
The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've put your prophets to death with a sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Now, he wasn't the only one left. There were 7,000 more, but he didn't know that. When you're emotional, in the emotional doubt, you feel like you're all alone. It's a, it's a very lonely place to live. And the Lord God said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And Elijah's like, all right, I don't want to miss this. Great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord. So imagine you're standing there, and, and it's just everything's going haywire out in the mountains. If you've ever been in a storm in the mountains, it's a scary place to be. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. I mean, you're thinking, oh, we're looking for the... And this is so indicative of so many people were just looking for that great big sign, and God wasn't in any of it. And he said, after that came a gentle whisper. You see, when we're in an emotional state, we don't need the big stuff. We just need that comfort. And so the gentle whisper of God came to Elijah. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, and he went out and he stood at the mouth of the cave, and the voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Why are you here when I'm with you there? Keep going. He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with a sword, and I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. He repeats his argument. When we're in an emotional state, I don't know if you've ever dealt with anybody in the state, but they generally can't see past their current situation. Why? Because they're stuck in it. That's an emotional doubt. He, the Lord just said to him, Elijah, I want you to go back from the way that you came. Go to the desert of Damascus, and when you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aram. All right? And so I want you to see that uh, the manner in which God deals with our doubts is different. But we've got to understand which one we're struggling with. We've got to be honest with ourselves. And I don't know where you're at here today. Maybe you're emotionally exhausted. Maybe you need, the, you need God to speak to your spirit. And I'm telling you, He will. He'll, he will lift you up. But maybe you're the one that needs to have the withered vine and be a little bit more miserable so God can get your attention. Or maybe you need to be able to see some factual evidence See some factual evidence that, that God is answering your prayers through what, the research that you're doing. I don't know where you're at, but I know this. I've, I've lived in every single one of those stages of life. Now, I don't have, I, I want to just share with you, it's really, it's fascinating to me how God orchestrates timing because this week, um, as I'm preaching on doubts, I went through one of my own uh, little episodes of doubt. Um, I've been working on something for over six years and, and dedicating my life to God on it, and, and it just, I was done. Tuesday came along this week, and I'm telling you, I was done. And uh, I, I'll tell you what my prayer was. I'm not suggesting this prayer to anybody. I'm just being honest and real with you. I went to bed Tuesday night, and I laid my head down on my pillow, and as I'm going to sleep, I just said, God, I don't want to be one of those effing idiots that stands up on stage and someone's mama didn't tell them they sucked. That was my prayer to God. I said, I'm done. If something doesn't change, I'm done. And uh, <laughs> Wednesday comes, and, uh, and that was my prayer. That was just simple, and I went right to sleep. I wasn't, I wasn't angry at God. I just, I just was done with that project. And I woke up the next morning and, and went about my day, and, and God showed up. One day I'll finish the story. I'll be able to tell you the story, but God showed up in a way that was phenomenal. And I, I can't tell you how encouraging it is when, when God doesn't have to slap you upside the head because you're volition, all right? When he whispers and provides, it's different than when he sh gives you the withered vine. And many times when you're in that stage of doubt, we don't even know which one we're in because we have to properly identify which doubt we're struggling with. But the cool thing is this, guys and ladies, guys and gals, as you walk through those doors, the same God that I serve and I've given my life for loves you more than I can begin to convince you of. But you've got to be real with your doubts. If you're here today, today and you just don't even think God is even real, man, you've got to release that into the power of God. If you're here today and you are resisting God and you're just sick of him telling you what to do and you don't think he's got your best interest in mind, you've got to lay it down. Don't let your story turn out like Jonah. 
And if you're here today and you're exhausted and emotionally spent, ask God to give you the strength that you need. Because here's what I know about God. Whichever state you're in, He's going to answer your prayer. He's going to give you what you need. Because that's the kind of God we serve. And He wants to be with you as much as he wants to be with me, as much as he wanted to be with Thomas, as much as he wanted to be with Elijah, as much as he wanted to be with Jonah. Put your name in the story because God wants to be with you in your story. The question is, will you let him? So at the end of the day, this is what I want you to close with. Your faith is being tested with doubts. And if it wasn't, it would be an untested faith. It's going to happen. But this is what God does. Flip to the next slide. You need to figure out as you go th- from here, you just have to identify what doubt. Maybe you're in a good spot. <laughs> Praise be to God. Don't ask for doubts, all right? They'll come all on their own when you don't want them. Just trust me on that. If you're in a de- stage of doubt, identify what it is. And then let God provide either the nail-scarred hands the withered bush or the strength and the rest that you need but be honest with where you're at because God wants you will you let him have you will you yield to him the only person the only person in this room that can answer that question is you let's pray God you are an awesome God and Lord you know right where we're at in our faith in you. And Lord, as I was talking to someone after second service, Lord, you you speak to each one of us as if we're the only person on this earth out of eight billion people. And Lord, you can speak to us like we're an individual. God, how you orchestrate that timing is far beyond my wildest understanding. But God, I know that you are speaking to each person in this room and you want to have an intimate, personal relationship with each of them. So God, wherever they're at in their walk with you, I pray today, God, that you speak to them in a way that only the power of your Holy Spirit can do. So God, we just just commit them to you. And Lord, whatever that message is, seal it up in their hearts, Lord. Let them hear directly from you. Whatever message it is, you speak to them. And Lord, may we just be may we give ourselves back to you may we respond back to you in a way that is glorifying and honoring to you god you're so faithful to us we don't we don't deserve your love in any way and yet you lavishly pour it out upon us may we lavishly pour it out on others as well god we love you we thank you we're grateful for you in your name we pray amen